You're listening to the Deep Purple Podcast, a fan podcast about one of the most legendary bands of all time, Deep Purple. We take a look at the music, history, and people behind the band Deep Purple and beyond. This week, we have a very special guest join us, and that is the one and only Don Airy. We talk about his time working with Bob Ezrin, uh, the Whoosh album that's upcoming, his relationship and works with Ozzy, Black Sabbath, Whitesnake, Rainbow, his relationship with John Lord, and much, much more. So please take a listen and enjoy. Okay, we have a very special guest today. That is Mr. Don Airy from Who Needs No Introduction, really. Don, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. How are you all doing there? We're doing fantastic, all things considered. Yes. Strange times we live in. uh, Indeed. (laughs) Absolutely. So, um, yeah, we're really excited uh, to have you on the show and, and talk about a few things. But f- first off, uh, how how are you feeling about your new album coming out? Yeah, it, it's quite exciting. You know, we we had a busy year planned. Mm. Um, you know, it was going to be the final final farewell tour. And, um, you know, with the release of the album in, it was due to be released around about now, I think. But they've delayed it till August. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's two two tracks out on the on YouTube, um, Man Alive and uh, Throw Throw My Bones, that uh, I really like the sound of. And, you know, it's, it's funny when you hear them on a little speaker on your on your MacBook, and <laughs> you think, God, it even sounds good on on my MacBook. So yeah, I can only imagine in the in the studio. Uh, what's it, what's it been like working with Bob Ezrin now on on three albums now? Well, he, he's like a force of nature, you know. You you turn up and you're not quite sure what's going to happen. And it's not that he cracks the whip. He just makes you enthusiastic about everything. And he's got definite opinions, you know, some of which are wrong, but they make you think. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Um, usually, he's just so right. And, of course, he's brilliant at mixing things. You know, he's one of the greats. So whatever you do, he, I mean, some people say, uh, I, I, I said to somebody in Nashville, oh, we're, we're Bob, Bob, uh, Bob Ezrin is producing us. He said, oh, you just go in and play one note and he does the rest. <laughs> <laughs> it probably all stems from a, 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 you know, great songs and a great performance. And then, yeah. th- then the, the work begins. But, um, so What's it been like now? Here, here it is. Eighteen years you've been with Deep Purple. This has no. got to be by far your longest stint in a in a band, right? Yeah, I mean, it used to be with me eighteen days. If, if I can <laughs> <laughs> eighteen years, I can't believe it. I mean, I think the yeah. longest I've been with any band was three years. Um, the first three years were very strange, actually. The the band were getting over, you know, John leaving. It, it came as a terrible shock to them. And they didn't give me much to go on, so I just ploughed on with what I thought was right. You know, and eventually it came together when we made Rapture of the Deep. Um, that, that was a, a difficult album to make, and I, I, I thought I played quite a part in it, you know, forcing, forcing the issue here and there. We had a wonderful producer called Michael Bradford, who a different style to Bob Ezrin, you know, he's very laid back. And um, it was really about 2006 that the band started to click as a band. And uh, we went from strength to strength from there. I noticed the audience was changing. That, that's what I noticed. We used to have the, you know, the silver-haired ponytail brigade. <laughs> what, I, what I call them. It was the majority of the audience. But gradually they got, they got pushed to the back by a sea of young people. It was 2006, 2007. We noticed, you know, when pop music really got computerized, I think, you know, 17, 18 year olds wanted to come and see a real band and they came to see us and vast numbers. We were, we were overwhelmed by it actually because everybody else was doing badly. Oh, we're doing great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Crowds outside the hotel, really? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, that's, that's amazing. And we're, we're coming in as kind yeah. of second generation Deep Purple fans. And then for us to now mm, see yeah. kids young enough to be our children at the show or, or being fans of you or following us, or following our show is really, really refreshing. Yeah, yeah. I know the number of times you, you, you sign an autograph for a young person. You say, oh, my grandmother's a big fan of you. <laughs> 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 oh, thank you. <laughs> it is still great, though, to hear um uh fans uh that um like nate said that are uh, younger you know rediscovering such a classic band um yeah. like you were saying um you know real music yeah i mean what we found is most of them i mean ian gillen said most of them know the lyrics better than i do <laughs> <laughs> you know he's taking yeah, cues from the front row but um yeah it's quite it's quite a sight and it's continued on you know, up to the uh, last few gigs. Um, yeah, been very gratifying. So um, um, we want to um, go back a little bit. Yeah. Um, Nate and I um, were uh, big fans of um, Ozzy growing up. So, oh, yeah. um, of course, the, uh, the <laughs> first place that uh, the first place that we recognize your name from is um, you're playing with Ozzy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, the, the Blizzard of Oz album. But prior to that, um, uh, you worked with Ozzy, or you met Ozzy um, in the seventies. Um, could you tell us about that? Yeah, no, I met him in a car park. Uh, I was with a band called Cozy Powell's Hammer, and um, we were staying at a hotel called the Post House somewhere in Birmingham. And Black Sabbath were having a meeting there, and you know, I bumped into Ozzy there. We had a, quite a chat, and he, he kind of remembered me and kept in touch. And um, they eventually called me up to um, to uh, Never Say Die, which was <laughs> quite an experience. <laughs> uh, do you have any um, Do you have any stories surrounding that God, album? Do I have stories for that one? <laughs> <laughs> any that you could tell? <laughs> well, you know, I was kind of dreading it a bit. They had quite a reputation, Sabbath, for being, you know, a bit wild. So I, 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 I had my keyboards delivered to the studio, and we set them up, and then. They all arrived, and were, except for Bill Ward. Oh, no, it was just Ozzy and Tony, actually. And when I went in, they were all drinking tea, and Ozzy goes, hello, Don, would you like a cup of tea? <laughs> Not what you were expecting. <laughs> <laughs> Not what I was expecting. There. And it was like going into a family's living room. Um, oh, wow. But, but, you know, the sessions were great. Um, there was one called Air Dance. Mm -hmm. It was the first time it really took me by surprise. Um, and, um, you know, when I listen to the piano playing on that, I think, well, Rick Wakeman, he you know. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was my predecessor. I think he'd done the album before me. Um, I did an intro to a track called Johnny Blades. And, um, you know, I just went in and played it once, and they said, that's great, come in. And I thought, well, that's the last I'll ever hear of that. They, you know, it was one take. It was that kind of album. And, um, I mean, there's one wonderful scene where Bill Ward arrived late on the second day and they set up all these booby traps for him. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, it came through from the front desk. Bill Ward is in the building. And um, so Tony goes, get playing. So I'm playing away on the mini mood or something. And uh, Bill bursts through the door and all these eggs and water get to go. <laughs> and there was just utter silence. You know, they stopped the tape and everyone stood there. And Bill had egg dripping off his beard and he was soaked. <laughs> and he turned to me and said, that sounds great, play it again. <laughs> <laughs> so he's just used to it at this point. <laughs> and he just sat down. And um, during the course of the session, I think it was just after they'd been... Uh, you know, supporting Kiss, or well, Kiss had been supporting them. And Ozzy drew Kiss makeup all over Bill's face <laughs> with a, with an indelible laundry mark. You know, and um, I came in three weeks later to do something else, and Bill came in, and you could still see how <laughs> the stuff on his face. But they were just wonderful characters. I, I couldn't. Believe. They, they kind of offered me the gig, but um, I think I think at the time, I, uh, Rainbow were making overtures to me, and uh, 
you know, I wanted to go back and work with Cozy, so and uh, see what this this guy Richie Blackmore was like. So, <laughs> and I'm sure that was that was something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, it, it was uh, I was on very friendly terms with Ozzy. He was such a and Tony. You know, they were such lovely people. When you when you got to know them, you couldn't imagine them being like that. You know, you think they'd be impossible to work with, but mm-hmm. just the opposite. You know, I always kept in touch with Tony too. Yeah. yeah. Well, as I, Nate and I can attest, we love a good prank story um, on the uh, on the show. So those are some of the funnier ones that I think we've heard. Um, yeah. So um, that um, that introduction to Ozzy um, did that relationship um, uh, continue on to you um, working with him um, on the first album? Yeah, they came down. Rainbow were playing at um, at Wembley, right? And we had a riot, right? Um, because Richie walked off stage after an hour and wouldn't come back, and <laughs> they started ripping seats up. And the dressing room was underneath the, underneath the um, where the seats were, and we hit this terrible sound. And Bob Daisley walks in, and uh, hello, Bob. I haven't seen him for a long time. He said, "I've come on a mission. You know, we we want you to. We've got a band with Ozzy. We've got this amazing guitar player, and we want you to join." I said. No, I'm staying with Rainbow. You know, things are going very well. And Bob goes, yeah, I can hear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the sound of carnage and destruction. Don't know. So that but might I, have sealed the deal, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I just agreed to do that. You know, I said, you know, I'm glad to help out. I mean, they were, they were, you know, they were in a very early stage. They didn't have much money or um, backing, you know. It was all pretty much Aussie financing everything. So I just, you know, I'll, I'll come down, I'll bring my keyboards and see what you want. Yeah. So I know that um, for, for a lot of us, including me and Nate, that was a really, um, uh, Blizzard of Oz was a really uh, important album for us when we were growing up. That was like yeah. sort of the, the holy grail, um, especially yeah. the, um, the, the iconic intro to Mr. Crowley. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, could you um, could you talk just a little bit about um, how it was playing on that album and working with the, all those amazing well, musicians? Yeah, I, 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 I said the keyboards were done afterwards, you know, mm-hmm. when they got the tracks. And, um, you know, I could hardly believe what I was hearing, you know. Um, I mean, Gary Moore had told me that he'd been to see Randy playing and he, he said he really rated him, which... Gary to say something like that it was quite extraordinary. <laughs> and, um, they wanted an intro, and uh, they were all sitting there like a judge and jury, you know, and eventually I just threw them all out <laughs> for the control room. I said, come back in half an hour. And just me and Max worked on it, and after half an hour, Ozzy came back in and said, oh, it's like you plugged into my head. And uh, that was it, you know. And they wanted me to play on the rest of the track, but I said it doesn't need it. You know, I did a little bit here and there. But I mean, the guitar was just so awesome, you know. <laughs> Andy was so humble. He was like, oh, do you like it? I said, no, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so your experience with uh, with most of that album was laying down tracks um, after, after the fact? Yeah, yeah, except... Um, I laid down Suicide Solution with Randy. Mm-hmm. I think the guitar, and the, there's a Hammond organ on there, not many people realise. Oh, wow. Um, playing with Randy. It doubles the riff, um, which, which is quite an effect, actually. But, oh, wow. I mean, he really loved it. He loved playing with keyboards. He said it was quite a rare thing for him. And we had a great time, especially towards the end, you know, the, the freak out bit. And you can hear the Hammond. I'm doing all the... Um, the upper draw bars, you know, whistling and uh, yes, yeah. I think I think it was just a couple of takes. He, he told me the piece, and then we just played it. And uh, it was great, great fun those sessions. Again, Ozzy was always, you know, he was always very relaxed in the studio. He loved being in the studio, Ozzy. So, ha- having worked with 
uh, being one of the greatest rock keyboardists of all time, working with some of the greatest uh, guitarists of all time. What's what are some of the subtle differences that, as a lay person, we might not understand of how do you work with Gary Moore versus Richie Blackmore versus Randy Rhodes? Yeah, yeah. Um, they're all different, and they're all um, they've all got the same one characteristics. It's, it's when they put the guitar on. They become a man possessed, you know. Uh, they can be very normal up to there. Good morning, yeah, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing all right. Join, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> and we're off. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I always liked it. I always like coming in and seeing the keyboards there and a big Marshall stack there. You know, you're in for a bit of fun, a bit of excitement. Um, but they're all different. Um, I mean, Gary Moore was so full of music it was hard to shut him up <laughs> and say listen that bit's good shall we run it again and he'd be on with something else by then he was quite the most extraordinary musician um, and he was trying to keep, keep keep him disciplined but what you do you just get in their slipstream as a keyboard player just they love it if you it makes them feel respectable because they're very insecure most of them and if you give them some nice chords and why don't we do a bridge here and we'll have a key change and have a little intro, you know. You know, it makes them, it makes them happy. And that's the secret. You've got to worm your way into their confidence. Um, with Richie, it was a, 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 a different matter altogether. R Richie was very deliberate about everything he did. And getting it, you know, he, he wouldn't change anything till the next day and then he'd take your idea uh, as though it was his <laughs> you'd think no oh, that's far if that I think this would be good and he starts playing what you suggested so you have to play games all the time but uh, Richie was another one that rehearsing with him and recording with him was just a, you know it was hard work but it was a pleasure you know he was so dedicated I remember playing Spotlight Kid in uh, Sweet Island Studios in Copenhagen. We did 33 takes. <laughs> wow. And that was on tape, and they were, they were struggling around looking for reels of tape. <laughs> and there was just, look, Richie go, I think we better do it again. <laughs> and everyone just sitting there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> like, who's going to crack first, you know, kind of thing. It was never Richie. <laughs> of course not. I could I never break that man's spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Much we, we though I can. <laughs> well, speaking of Spotlight Kid, our, our the most recent episode that we just recorded was on uh, difficult to cure. So, do you have any any other stories or, or memories from recording that album or the tour or anything? Well, yeah, I got a very strange one, uh, which was. Um, you know, we had a new drummer that by that time, Bobby Rondinelli, who was very, you know, a real novice in, in many ways. I mean, lovely guy, and he had the right idea. But just get, getting a drum sound out of him was, was a bit hard, you know. Um, and I remember we were all sitting down, and, you know, there was nothing nasty about it, but we were getting the engineer, Fleming Rasmussen, to try a few different things. And Richie was going, well, we've got to try and make it a bit more like Bonham. Because Bobby played a lot like Bonham. Bonham. He just didn't kind of have the thump. And we were trying all different things with Bobby. And it was coming together. And eventually, I forget what it was, uh, Difficult to Cure, the title track. You know, the drums really started to sound good. And Richie said, well, look, you know, it's not Bonham, but we get, we're getting there. You know, and then... <laughs> The news came through that Bonham had died. It was just when we finished the session and there was a phone call to Richie and Richie said, you're not going to believe this, but Bonham, Bonham just died. It, it was odd. You know, but a lot of things happen like that in, in rock bands. I mean, Tony Iommi told him so many strange things that happened to him with Sabbath that you just wouldn't believe it. You know, Ozzy used to tell me some great stories that you couldn't believe, you know, supernatural happenings and the like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can only imagine receiving word like that. It's got to be a little spooky. And th things were kind of 
I mean, as somebody from looking from the outside in, it just seems like things were moving at warp speed during that time. And, you know, you, you said you were in a band for whatever, 18 days. <laughs> now, <laughs> now you're in a band for 18 years. Things like yeah, yeah. So it seems like things have slowed down a little bit as far as the yeah, yeah, yeah. the tempo or the pace. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, another um, another Deep Purple uh, connection um, that uh, we'd like to talk about is um, how you uh, first met uh, and started working with uh, David Coverdale. Oh, I've known him for years, you know. I think when he first formed White Snake, um, I remember going around to his uh, house. He lived in London. And we had a bit of a chat. But I, I forget what I was doing at the time. I was in a band called Coliseum too, And I said, no, I'm pretty tied up with that. So, um, you know, I didn't join then. But <laughs> I went to their first gig, which is at uh, Folkestone, Lee, Lee's Clip Hall. I just found the photographs. I took quite a few pictures. Oh, wow. And, oh. Um, yeah, I thought, God, this is a good band. <laughs> you know, the, the, the guitar work was splendid. You know, Mickey Moody and Bernie together were always a, a force to be reckoned with. And Neil Murray, of course, what a great bass player. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but um, you know, I was kept in touch with them, always very friendly. And then the next thing... I worked on um, 87, the 87 album, but I worked on it in 85 um, <laughs> because David lost his voice. I don't know what happened to him, but he just couldn't sing. And it took him a year really to play. I think uh, Keith Olsen told me subsequently that he tricked Coverdale into singing. Well, I said, come in, I've got some new monitors. I want you to try them out. And they did Still of the Night. So... I mean, extraordinary thing. Still of the Night is one take. Really? Wow, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's one take. And um, Keith said, you can go home now. Job done. <laughs> and Coverdale went, what? And he got his confidence back. You know, and he apparently did the rest of the album in, in a few days. You know. Yeah. Things can happen like that to singers. It's very, very strange with them. So, so was the '87 album the first, um, the first album that you worked on with White Snake? Yeah, yeah. I, I just did two. I did um, what was the next one? Slip of the tongue. Slip of the tongue. Yeah. Yeah. Which by well, which time David was rich and famous, and not quite the same person. <laughs> <laughs> but he was pretty. He was great, actually. And so did you um did, did you work closely with him um in the band on those albums or well, was no, it no, more I, I did just what a keyboard player does you you spared all the agony to go <laughs> in afterwards <laughs> and I think with um eighty seven I, I did five or six days with the great engineer Mike Stone he was wonderful to work with and I worked with him on a couple of other projects sub subsequently. <laughs> and then on slide, um, blah, 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 slip of the tongue, it was um, Keith Olsen, who was uh, wonderful, and um, Mike Clink, actually, who was working on Steve, Steve Vai's bit. And then David was there most of the time, yeah, making suggestions. And, you know, he, he was very helpful. He didn't get in the way, I must say. He was just working as quickly as he could mm -hmm. you know, to get it done. You know, time is money. <laughs> yeah. Get on with it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so getting back to your your time in Deep Purple, uh, it, it yeah. seemed um, it seemed obvious to everyone when it was when it was announced. I remember hearing that you're, you you know, Don Airy is going to be replacing John Lord, and it was just kind of like, well, of course. I mean, who else would possibly? <laughs> who else has? Well, the, who else is? <laughs> It has the skill level and who else is, has that kind of tie with the band? It seemed, it seemed so obvious. Um, mm. But of course, there was that period where you two were kind of working together as well. Can you talk about, and you worked together before that as well. What's your memories of John, working with John? I, I just worked with John on one, one project, which was The Wind in the Willows, it was called, mm -hmm. by um, Eddie, oh God, I've forgotten his name. Eddie Harden. <laughs> Eddie Harden, thank you. Harden and York, it came to my mind just then. Um, and we did, uh, you know, three days rehearsal and then a couple of festivals in, in Germany. And he was just great to work with. You know, such a gentleman. And uh, just a, such a great player. 
Um, there was one thing that, that <laughs> when I first toured with Purple, he had to come back contractually and be on the bill as well. You know, so he'd, he'd come on halfway through the show or whatever, and I was quite worried about that. Oh, how's that going to work, you know? <laughs> but it worked perfectly, and I, we used to travel together. And we talk so much, we get lost. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we now? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, dear boy. You better look at the map, you know, before sat nav. And uh, I remember saying to him at the end of the tour that he, he was the second best Hammond organ player I'd ever seen. And he looked a bit hurt. I think he thought I meant Keith Emerson was the best person. No, Jimmy Smith's the best. I don't if you're familiar with Jimmy Smith. And he said, Oh, sure. that's praise and beauty. And I really meant it. Yeah. He was absolutely incredible player. Yeah. We did a, a lovely thing. He he turned up, he'd been doing some orchestral stuff in um Korea and Hong Kong. And then he had one in Japan. So he, he came Purple were in Japan and we were playing some hall. I, I can't remember, but 5,000 seater. And John turned up and uh, I made a pretense that I was trying to avoid him. <laughs> 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 and he came up to me, he said, Don, Don, I, 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 I don't want to get up and play. I said, John, you're getting up to play whether you like it or not. <laughs> and um, we, we did it quite cleverly. I talked to the lighting guy about it. So... Um, I did my keyboard solo and then they dipped the lights on me and, and uh, my son Mike, who's, who's my keyboard tech, you know, got John crouched down and we, we kind of brought John on. I got off when it went dark. So what the audience saw was that so I changed, the keyboard player changed from me to John <laughs> and nobody was aware that John was there, you know, and the, wow. the reaction um, it was like a football crowd when their teams won the championship or something. This huge roar, and John launched into Perfect Stranger. It was oh, just marvellous. And I was, you know, a willing watcher from behind, and Mr. Udo, the promoter, came up to me, tears streaming down his face. He <laughs> said, you are number one. I said, no, he's number one. <laughs> The audience got their money's worth that night. Wow. They certainly did. And wow. we, we, we stayed on for the encore and we played together. And, what a, and we, we switched, I think, in hush. I played the keyboards, he played the organ, then he played the keyboards. And, I, you know, it was just wonderful. And then off he went, yeah. So you had very, very little notice uh, the first time you filled in, right? You, you only had a, a few days' notice couple of days and I was working on something else. I had some symphonic arrangements I was doing. So I thought, oh dear. So when I got tired of writing music, I'd do a bit more purple. So I was up for a couple of days. Um, I mean, I was familiar with the purple stuff, but actually playing with the band's a different thing. And they put me on the wrong plane, so I didn't get to the rehearsal <clears throat> till it was too late, really. And we went through uh, just one track, called Fools, and then we did Woman from Tokyo, at the end of which Roger came home and said, welcome to the band. I said, thank you very much. And uh, next day on at Skanderberg, 30,000 people up the hill, you know, an ordeal by fire. I enjoyed it, actually, but yeah, I was surprised at what great shape the band was in. You know, Steve Morse was leading the charge, and um, Pacey was just playing great again. Because um, I'd worked with him with Gary Moore. I don't think he, he, he wasn't, I mean, he's incapable of playing badly, but he, his heart wasn't in it so much. Mm -hmm. I think he lost, you know, people, you can lose heart when you're a musician, have a bit of a down period, and then you come up again. So, so rumor has it you're, you're actually using John Lord's old Hammond with the band? No, no, <clears throat> no, I've, I've, I've well, that Hammond, God, when, I mean, it's a legendary beast, that one. It belonged to Christine McVie in oh, wow. Fleetwood Mac. And John bought it from her in 1974. And she'd had it on the road for since 66, I think. And he had it on the road. It was on the road till, well, for 40 years, more or less. But by the time I got it, God, it was in a terrible state. 
no, it just wasn't wasn't working properly. And um, we got to LA, and I, I got got my guy in, and he just stripped it down, completely stripped it down, and rebuilt it, and it sounded a bit better. <laughs> it ended its days. Um, we 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 had some gigs in Russia, and uh, it just fell off a cargo plane. Oh my god! I mean, the the, the guys got on. And they, they just pushed it off, and the ramp wasn't down. They just oh. saw the ramp was there. Oh, <laughs> Boom, you know. oh man. <laughs> and that was the end of it. Um, oh, no. But, but, but I had it repaired. We, we, we got it ready, and it's in storage. <clears throat> so and now I use um, a man called John Harbury um, in Connecticut. He used to uh, box them up, you know, he'd split them, called chop them. You get a, a, A100s, which is very much my preferred instrument. John, John always likes C3s, but an A100 is what, what I like to play. And he took A100s and split them. So I've got three of them, just in case, you know. <laughs> There's a little some backups. <laughs> They're very temperamental instruments, right? No, 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 no. Oh, the, the, the Hammond, I mean? No, no. Uh, they're the most over-engineered keyboard ever made. And I think in the whole time with Purple, I've only had two, two breakdowns, one of which was in Japan before a big gig. And about 10 minutes before the gig, I saw Mike, you know, my tech, coming into the dressing room with a look on his face. Normally come in, you know, 45 minutes before, or to service him. And he came in 10 minutes before and said, ooh, this doesn't look good. <laughs> And he said, we can't get it working. We think the capacitors have gone. Um, he didn't have any spares. I mean, you can't get to them anyway, even if you had the spares. So, so I did the whole gig on keyboards. I don't remember much about it. Nobody seemed to notice much. <laughs> <laughs> Except Steve Morse, who had to come around the side when we were exchanging, you know, riffs and all that. <laughs> Steve Moore stood on the drum rider. It was a fantastic sight to see. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, Hammonds, are, they're very strange. They're all different. Um, they'll take it out of you as a keyboard player. It's not like playing a piano or something. Um, it, it, it drains you. I, don't, I can't explain what it is. Um, you know, it takes it out of you. It doesn't give you much back. Till, till you hear a recording. But John said this pretty much the same thing, that he was always very, very reverential to it. Mm -hmm. He said he, he, he disapproved of me having the Hammond up on a riser. <laughs> <laughs> he said, dear boy, you've got to have it on the ground. You've got to bury your head <laughs> before you play it, you know. But, uh, yeah. So even even though you you started kind of a, pl playing Hammond at a very young age, you got known a little bit more for your Moog work in the yeah, in yeah. the seventies. I had the pleasure of actually uh, touring the Moog facility in Asheville uh, last Did year. You? Yeah, and it was I been there. Yeah. oh, it was astonishing. It was a great. It's such a tiny little place, and you see yeah. how personal these. I, I I live right down the street from the old Hammond oh, really? factory. I don't yeah. know if they do if they still do anything there, but um, just seeing the personal touch of these are the people built, they pump out a hundred cents a day or whatever. And it's yeah, an yeah. incredible place. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always in touch with them. Um, especially they've, they found that they used to be based in Buffalo and um, I went to the old factory years and years ago. It was very scenic. It was like a corrugated iron shed next to a big, a little lake <laughs> was there. And uh, it was very scenic, I remember. But they, they found a storage facility about four, three, three years ago that was full of um, Curtis chips and all the stuff they used to make mini moves. And there was enough to make 2,000 mini moves. So I, I immediately put my name down for one. And... Uh, you know, it was a limited run with the old, the old um, technology. And oh, I've got one. It's just a thing of beauty and a joy forever. Many moves. I've got a lot of voyages as well. I like moon voyages. They're, they're wonderful things to work with. But uh, there's nothing like a mini moon. Yeah. 
I was talking to Rick Wakeman the other day. I said, how many men mugs have you got? He said, nine. <laughs> he said, three, are, three are broken, three at the menders, and I've got three always working. <laughs> three at a time. He can't, live without, he can't live without them. That's an incredible sound. Yeah, yeah. He, got, he, he told me a funny story about how he got his first one. You know, he'd heard about them, and um, they were very hard to get hold of in England. But he heard that Jack Wilde, who was in the first Oliver, in the, the, uh, played the Artful Dodger in the film Oliver, was oh, a bit wow. of an amateur musician. And he had one. So he found him, up, what's it like? What's it like? And Jack said, oh, I don't like it very much. It's no good for me. And uh, it's broken. Why oh, do you want to sell it? Yeah. Okay. So Rick played instead of, I think, 1,200 quid was the going rate because it wasn't working properly. It was 600. He got this thing for 600 pounds. So, so when he got it there, he played it. It was perfect. You know, it worked perfectly. So he found Jack it wild up. He said, what exactly was wrong with it? He said, well, you can only get one note at a time. <laughs> <laughs> so Rick said, well, I said nothing. <laughs> That's great. So uh, going on to some of your other achievements, um, the, the UK has won you the Euro- <laughs> <laughs> uh, The UK has won the Eurovision Song Contest five times, but the last time they won it was with you. So That's what- right, yeah. They just had a big um, rerun on, on, on the BBC this weekend, actually. Oh, wow. And um, they didn't actually show me, but they... Uh, Usually the conductor used to take a bow. You know, I was a musical director and did the arrangement for it and conducted the orchestra. But uh, it was great to see it again. I mean, a great song. and They were a great band. And um, afterwards I thought, God, I've, I've lost touch with the waves. I wonder how they all are. And um, I suddenly noticed in the emails that there was one from Kim, Kimberly Rue, the guitar player with all the addresses of, um, you know, Alex and Vince on it. So, so I emailed all of them and heard back from them. You know, I got all their news in a day. And they're great to hear from them. Oh, they're lovely people to work with. Well, I always say I never knew a band that used to bicker so much as Katrina and the Waves. <laughs> really? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> like an old married oh, couple? <laughs> oh, they're terrible. I remember we started to take once. You know, we tried about 12 times and, oh, it wasn't good enough and kept stopping. And we started this take and, and the bass player then stopped it again. And Alex, the drummer, goes, what's wrong this time? Well, you got it right. And well, why can't you get it right every time? <laughs> <laughs> I just cracked up. I remember that. So I'm going to go and have a cup of tea, guys. <laughs> Let's reconvene. <laughs> They were great, yeah. It, it, it was a sad day that they split up immediately after doing so much good for themselves. So, so um, Don, being a, um, a touring, uh, working musician for um, for so many years, how does yeah. um, how does it look uh, these days uh, being on uh, for you being on lockdown? It's um, it's strange. I mean, I, I really enjoyed the first bit of it. it my wife said, this is the longest you've ever been at home. <laughs> and um, she hasn't strangled me yet, but it's been close. <laughs> you know. And I've had to learn how to be, you know, domesticated. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, may, I always used to make a shot at, but never got it right. But um, it's very strange. It's nice to have a break, but not, not like this. It's, it's horrible what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know, it's pretty bad here. I believe it's worse in America. My son, Mike, actually is in uh, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. He's stuck there. But uh, I think he's got to fly home sometime and I'll let him go. Yeah. So uh, what, is, uh, what is one of the things you're looking forward to most uh, when restrictions are lifted and we can, uh, you know, all get back to uh, kind of uh, uh, something uh, resembling uh, normalcy? Well, in England, I mean, I'm really missing going to the pub, you know, and seeing me, all my friends where we live and, and uh, talking about football. You know, they've stopped the football season. 
Now, what do men talk about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's very difficult. <laughs> but with football, you've always got something to talk about. <laughs> so is, um, uh, during this time, is there, um, is there anything that, are you using uh, the, the time to work on any new uh, projects or... Um... Well, somebody, somebody said, are you composing lots? I said, no, I'm decomposing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not doing anything, actually. I'm, I'm, um, I've, I've got a couple of projects on the go that I've come to a full stop, you know, and I can't do anything until I can get back in the studio. Um, but I'm rather enjoying not having any deadlines. or It's a weird feeling, you know, to always have that compulsion. You've got to get something finished by yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Or you've got to be on a plane tomorrow and they're picking you up at 6 a.m. Um, you get very used to it. And not, to, not to have that is, is a novelty for me. And, um, you know, I'm missing, missing seeing the family. But they all live close by, so they come and sit in the garden at the opposite end and we shout across, you know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think it's very difficult, difficult for everyone. Yeah. For sure. So um, I read this on Wikipedia, so it could be completely false, but there it says that you <laughs> <laughs> it says that you were you were working on a book. Is there any truth behind that? Oh yeah, well, well I am working on that actually. Oh good. I've got about halfway done, and I'm um, I'm going through all the old. I've got all my itineraries. Oh wow! You know, I can show you. I can show you oh. one. Yeah, prize possession. Oh wow! wow. Look at that. Ozzy Osbourne, 1984. You know, leather bound. Yeah. Oh, look at that. That's something. <laughs> so I'm just compiling a list of gigs. God, it makes you worn out reading them, how, how many gigs, you know, one has done during a <laughs> career. Because you, you tend to think, as a musician, you don't look back much. I've never really looked back. You're always looking forward, and you've got to be on the ball and have something new. And, you know, you, you can't be... Tommy Aldridge once said to me, the big enemy in this business is complacency. And I remember it, it was pretty profound and that's something I've always kept in mind. Never, never be complacent, always be looking ahead, you know. So to look back is, is a nice experience. So I am writing things up, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's interesting you bring up uh, complacency because we find a lot of the times we end up talking on the show about different fan reactions and we, we get, we get rather annoyed with fans that want every band to sound like they sounded 40 years ago or 50 years ago. And whenever they try something new, uh, there's a group of fans who react negatively towards that. So have you had any reactions like that from fans or how how do you deal with something like that? What do they call them? The, uh, nabobs of negativity. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, the n- yeah. nattering nabobs of negativity. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Great quote. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a website called the Highway Star. We I go on occasionally, mm-hmm. and you see, oh, 110 comments. Well, I'll have a look. <laughs> and even the good ones, you think, come on, guys, haven't you got a life to go to? You know? <laughs> I mean, in my day, you listen to someone and say, God, I really like that, or I don't like it. But now they're... Everyone takes it to heart and, you know, the self-aggrandizement thing is, is quite a severe, you know, the, the breakdown of society because of globalization. Oh, I'm getting philosophical now, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> means that people don't belong to a community anymore. Well, you know, people are very separate and uh, they live their lives on a screen. So things like Deep Purple's new album can really upset them when it shouldn't, you know. I mean, I've, I've seen, a, I, yeah. I see a huge amount of a po- positive uh, thing, especially about the last three albums, which everyone is yeah, yeah. Uh, very, but th- there, yeah, there's always people that will harp on the fact that, oh, it hasn't been the same since Richie left or whatever. And it's come, yeah. come on guys, it's been all, over 30 years, almost 30 years at this point. And- I mean, it, it's true. <laughs> you know, it, it hasn't been the same and it hasn't been the same since John left. No, of course. It's a different band. But the band... You know, still, I mean, I've never been with a band that functions the way Purple does. 
and they do it the same way they've always done it, which is, you know, we get together in a rehearsal room and Pacey goes, Blap! and he's off. And we all try and keep up with him. <laughs> and apparently it's the way it's always being done. And you just feel that there's... That there's um, I mean, Bad Company used to... I remember talking to Mick Ralphs and he said... I said, I said to him, it must be nice working in a four-piece. <laughs> and he said, no, we've got five members. There's this secret one. We all know he's there. And he's there all the time. You know, there was a fifth member. And it was a very palpable thing for, for them all. That there was a, a presence there. And it's the same with Purple. You, you get this thing that... Um, the spirit of the band, you know, and Roger's always talking about it. Um, it seems to carry you through. I mean, the, the, that album now, what, we were quite unprepared for the success. Mm. We're kind of flinching a bit, <laughs> waiting for the, you know, but, but um, you know, the way it was received was, was great. Yeah. Oh, and and it, also, it's fantastic, and we're really looking forward to the next one. And uh, I, for one, am glad that you haven't just... Uh, been cranking out 12 different versions of Machine Head over the past yeah. <laughs> 50 mm -hmm. years. It's nice to, to have the, all of these new new things to look yeah. forward to. Well, uh, there, there was a big, you know, there was a patch where the band didn't record for about six years, but it, it was because we were having, like I was talking about, the young people were coming to the gigs. Mm -hmm. and we were doing so many gigs, it just wasn't time to record. But um, it, it, it was... Uh, you know, it's never the same twice with Bob Ezrin. He always does things a different way. And I remember this time with me, I mean, he always plays mind games with me. I don't know what it is. But now what? I think he gave me about, after the basic tracks were down, he gave me a couple of hours to overdub. And I remember I did something like 25 overdubs in two hours. And then he gave me an hour and a half on the last album. And this one, no time at all. Really? I mean, everything's live. He got everyone to play live. That's what he wanted. And uh, it, it's quite a, quite a feat to do that. Because, because the old days of tape, you just got used to the overdub. I'll fix it later on. And you can overdub, you know, we'll drop in here and we'll do that. But, but with Pro Tools, it's a different matter. You can just keep playing and do another take. And they can take bits from here and bits from there. And it's in its own way, it doesn't sound as good as tape, but it's freed up the creative process, I, I think. Yeah. Not none more so than working with Bob Ezrin. <laughs> <laughs> Tough though he is. Oh my mm -hmm. god, that man. <laughs> <laughs> He's cruel to be kind, you know. <laughs> yeah, we we've definitely heard stories about um how we can uh, how he can be a, uh, I think a word is used a lot as a taskmaster on uh, yeah, yeah. the albums that he's worked on. Very, very uh, hard on the bands, but uh, to get such a a, a good product. Oh yeah, he, he, his intentions are for the best, and he's got an incredible brain. Well, he's a producer. He's not a he's a, not a musician. So I think he used to tread the boards as a folk singer when he first started in Canada. Oh really? In Toronto, yeah. But he was up against. You know, Joni Mitchell and Neil Young, and he talked about it a bit. And I said, well, sing us a song, Bob. And he got an acoustic guitar, and I forget what he sang, but it was very beautiful. And you thought, oh, he could have made it maybe as a folk singer, but he, he recognised early on, you know, that people like Joni and Neil were, were tough competition, and he had <laughs> set his sights elsewhere, which he did, you know. I'll never forget hearing that first Alice Cooper album. It blew me away. Just the sound of it. Wow. Never heard anything like that. And the sound still blows me away. Yeah. Yeah, and the songs that we've heard so far were, were, sound great. So I'm yeah. sure the rest of the album is going to follow suit. It was funny, actually. He sent us the first mixes and something disastrous happened. Um, there was some kind of phasing cance phasing cancellation that meant that all you could really hear was Ian Gillen <laughs> and I thought hmm I think Gillen loved it yeah. the rest of it <laughs> <laughs> we, we made our feelings known and when Bob listened on his Mac he, oh my god and he, he immediately 
I mean, he adjusted everything. When it came back, it was just, I thought it was sensational. You know, it's kind of, you go, if you go, is that us? <laughs> <laughs> is that me there playing that? Wow. It's the, that's one of the perils of uh, th this technology is great. And there's so much you can do with it. But when you are yeah. mixing in real time, you could, you're hearing exactly what you're going to hear. And now you just hit render and you don't realize you have some track, yeah. some effect on it or some tracks turned off. And <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I mean, Pacey says that in the old days with tape, everything seemed to sort itself out naturally. Mm -hmm. Can't explain why. I mean, they were saturating the tape purple. They were really the first to do it. And he said, when you listen back, you were just amazed at what you heard. So amazed that you, you got what was wrong and what was right, and you could immediately change it. But, but now when you listen back to something, it sounds like it did when you played it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, at least I played it right. Uh, you get the small picture without the big picture. And having, having Ezra around is, is very handy for a band. You know? <laughs> very handy for this band. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, so we want to be respectful of your time. You've, you've been so great uh, <laughs> talking to us, and we really do appreciate it. Um, but in closing, is there... It's been a pleasure. You, you've asked some great questions. Normally, you know, sometimes, you, you, oh, God, you get these <laughs> questions you, you can't answer. <laughs> there was a great one recently in a press conference, and somebody said to Roger... It was abroad, I think it was in, where were we? Uh, Bulgaria or somewhere. So, what did you think when you first played Smoke on the Water? <laughs> so Roger goes, G, B flat, C. <laughs> <laughs> this poor guy was expecting some cosmic. <laughs> no, I connected with a cosmos, man. <laughs> No, no. We have a strict no questions about smoke on the water policy. We figure, <laughs> what what more questions could be asked about that? Um, but if, exactly. if so, if if you had gone, if you had not gone into the music route, what what other interests yeah. do you have? What what do you what sort of profession do you think you would have gone into if music hadn't been for you? Oh, I was going to be a music teacher. Um, I, would, you know, I was a classical pianist. I mean, not not a concert pianist, but I, I was good enough to have taught people. Um, which I thought was what I was going to do and, you know, have a, a band on the side and work in nightclubs. And, but, um, you know, one day the, the phone rang. Uh, I, I, when I was in Manchester, I was at music college there. And it was the day the course ended. And I, I, I lived in a bed sit. And with my bass, the bass player, who was a bass student at the college, he lived upstairs. And the, the phone went. There was a phone in the hall, you know. And it was an agent saying, oh, we've seen your band um, at some nightclub we were backing some singer. He said, you're very good, you boys. Do you think you could be in Southampton tomorrow to go on a cruise liner <laughs> <laughs> with your gear? He said, you've got to be there at 6 o'clock, because we 6 o'clock in the morning, because we've got to register you the uh, make semen of you, you know, you get an official card. So I said, yeah, yeah, we'll be there. I said, you give me the details. Okay, I'll see you, see you there. So I went upstairs to Adrian, Adrian Evans. I said, what are you doing tomorrow? He said, oh, I, don't, I don't know, I have a day off. I said, no, we're going to Southampton. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we put the, a keyboard and his bass equipment in the back of his, he had a small car. And we drove, we drove overnight to Southampton and uh, where the, the ship's band, you know. <laughs> it was great. And, and then took it from there, you know. And now rock cruises are all the rage, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember being on a... Gillen and I once, we didn't want to fly, so we went on the tour bus. Um, you know, we were going from Copenhagen to... Germany, somewhere in East Germany, and uh, of course you get this lovely ferry ride. And we were the only people on the whole ferry. <laughs> there was no lorries or anything. It was just our, our bus. Huh? And me and Ian, and we were sitting upstairs talking, and Ian was looking at the vast spaces with nobody in it, and he said, you know, it could get fans. 
<laughs> he had this great idea, and I thought he was crazy. But, you know, he's very far-sighted, Mr. Gillen. <laughs> <laughs> and he was talking, we'll have to, we'll hire this boat, and we'll get fans to, and he put it to the rest of the band, and nobody wanted to know. This is 2004 or something. But I never forget, it was sitting up on deck with him in, in the moonlight, sailing, sailing across this, the open sea, you know. That's a gr- mm. It's a great idea. Probably, probably not so much these days. I don't know yeah. how you're going to get yeah, people yeah, on a cruise we're, boat, but yeah, the princess, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I know. The, the deep purple cruise. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be up for that. <laughs> yeah, I've got my, my the, the guy who sings in my own band, uh, Carl Sentence. He does a lot of it with Nazareth. Yeah, he loves it. He said, "Oh, Todd Rundgren's going to be." On the cruise, I said, good God, Todd. So I got him to get Todd's autograph for me. You know. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Which is a treasured thing, yeah. I thought, God, Todd Runger during the cruise. <laughs> okay, the next. <laughs> well, Don, thank you. Thank you so much for taking some time with us. We really, really Well, I hope I haven't waffled it. on too much. Oh, no. That's, that's, no, this is I've been great. in lockdown, you know, it's my first taste of freedom. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can come back anytime you want another taste yeah, of freedom. Thank you to you guys. It's been, a, really, this, it's been really. our pleasure. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. And there you have it. That was our interview with Don Airy. It was truly a pleasure and a privilege. And we will see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Deep Purple Podcast. If you like what you hear and would like more episodes in the future, please donate on Patreon to support the show. You can also give us a rating on iTunes to help new people discover the show. You can follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for show updates. See deeppurplepodcast.com for more details. Thank you for listening. Wow, I, I, one take, see? That's even, awesome. Even with vocals, you just want your one take wonder. <laughs> That's great. <laughs>